for that introduction. Uh, thank you all very much for giving up some of your time today to come and listen to me and discuss the subject with me. Um, actually, I wanted to start with a couple of volunteers from the audience. If I could have, ask a couple of people to come up. Any, uh, any volunteers? I've got some members of my family if, in the audience, so if they're volunteers, they're going to have to come too. Thank you very much. Unemployment would 
carry on rising because companies become more productive and efficient. And if they become more productive and they can produce the same stuff with fewer people, then fewer people would have jobs. So that's another reason that GDP growth matters. And anyway, if growth didn't matter, why would we care about abolishing poverty? The argument people make in what economists call the Easterlin paradox, and the paradox is that if you look at any individual country at the same time, at one time, richer people are happier than poorer people. If you look at countries over time, then that's the link that seems to break down. Getting richer as a country doesn't seem to increase happiness. And the argument put forward to explain this is that actually people get used very quickly to their level of well-being. When I was a little girl, we didn't have central heating, we didn't have a car and a telephone, and I was pretty happy. And um, it's only, it's, it's a process of psychological adaptation. And the argument goes that if, we, if the reason GDP doesn't matter is that actually we just adapt to what we had and we don't need more and more all the time. If that were the case, though, why would we care about getting people out of poverty? Because they can be perfectly happy if they adapt psychologically to whatever they have. So you might be wondering by now why I started out by saying, uh, to talk about the economics of enough, by saying that the most vociferous argument being made against economic growth is nonsense. A lot of people, I think, like the idea that growth doesn't make us happy, because partly because it's an easy answer. If you can just say, we don't need to grow, so there's no problem about sustainability, we just stop doing that, then that looks like an easy solution to problems of sustainability. I think also it's quite emotionally appealing, isn't it, when we've come out of the sort of era of excess and materialism that we had before the financial crisis. It's quite appealing to find that distasteful. So I think a lot of people like that idea. But I'm in the realm of practicality, and I don't think an idea based on something that's statistically incorrect and, and incorrect in the real world is ever going to make much headway. I'm much more interested in addressing sustainability in practical ways, even if that means finding a much harder set of answers to the problems. So my first message today is actually, it's not easy. The economics of enough is not easy, both politically and I think morally, because we do care about poverty. It's necessary to find ways that the economy can carry on growing sustainably. And sustainability in that case means giving the future its proper weight in the decisions that we take today about how much we're going to consume and what we're going to do. So sustainability becomes about, about caring properly for the future and exercising our stewardship responsibly. The second message in the book is that sustainability is about much more than just the environment. There, it has financial, social and political aspects as well. And I think in each of those dimensions, the Western economies are either at or approaching points of crisis. And I'm sure a lot of you feel the same thing too, and that's why you're here to listen to a talk of this title today. I think it's most obvious in the financial case, of course, because of the financial crisis. If you cast your mind back to October 2008, it was when Le Lehman Brothers had collapsed. And being an economist, I pay close attention to the Financial Times and the interbank interest rate, which is the rate that banks charge each other to borrow money overnight to sort out short-term liquidity problems, just went off the charts. It increased so much. And I looked at those and I thought, blimey, if they don't trust each other with their money overnight, I don't trust them with my money either. <laughs> and for a week, I went to the cash machine and got out as much cash as I possibly could. <laughs> because I thought it really quite likely that they'd stop working. And after two days of doing that, I thought, well, if the electronic payment system is stopping working, then that means that my supermarket won't be able to order any goods, and I won't be able to pay by debit card in the supermarket, and um, I'd better fill up the car with petrol and go buy some water and some tinned goods, so I did that too. <laughs> now, that um, turned out to be true. That fear was not unfounded. The Bank of England, a year later, quietly admitted that it too had been concerned that those electronic payment systems were stopping working. And that's an extraordinarily serious financial crisis. There hasn't been any change in banking behaviour, by the way. The same risks are on the increase again, and um, I think it's a really very worrying situation. What's more, taxpayers are bearing the cost 